So back to the committee's meeting, I'm going to pause this for a second and uh, just give you an, this was a very interesting question that just happened. The question was that there is a contradictory data, FDA and CDC saw different data points for strokes. I think one agency found statistically significant data for strokes increase and the other agency did not. One agency included transient ischemic attacks or TIAs in the discussion, in the analysis, the other did not. So the question then became for both of these agencies that where do we stand from a, for a public messaging? So hear the question and then see how do they respond. Let me forward this a little. Okay, so thanks, Dr. Palmer. Back here. Um, one question for the three presenters uh, from earlier on safety. I really appreciate the fact that they presented data that's um, somewhat contradictory um, uh, on, on uh, the safety related to stroke. Um, and I, I appreciate it because we should be able to handle those sorts of data. They're real. But I, I'd love to get their take on the public message. What should someone who is listening in from the public take away on the safety of vaccines relative to ischemic strokes? So I'm pausing because they are live as well, but I had rewinded a little bit. So I'll go back towards live. So this is a very important question. The, uh, the I do not remember who what is his name, but he's asking that both agencies found the data to be contradictory. What should be the public messaging? And here out, both agencies responding, CDC is going to respond first and then FDA. Or, or the other way, we'll see. Hi, this is this is Tom Shimovakuro. Can can you hear me? Yeah. So this is CDC. Check Thanks. out his answer. I mean, I'll just reiterate that CDC continues to recommend that everyone eligible for a COVID nineteen mRNA bivalent booster or a flu vaccine get vaccinated. I mean, we detected a a statistical signal, and we are in the process of of assessing that signal. And I don't think the evidence are not sufficient to conclude that there is a safety problem um, with respect to stroke. And the, and, and the CDC recommendations um, are that everyone who's eligible get a bivalent booster. And um, we'll continue to, to um, do more work on this. And also, as Dr. Forshee mentioned, um, ad additional more formal epidemiologic investigations. And we'll continue to, uh, we, we will um, make information available um, as it becomes known to us. And this is Rich Forshi. I'd just add a little bit to what Tom had to say. I, I think the- So that was CDC. I, I am surprised that there was not even a consideration to say maybe flu, high dose flu vaccine should be separated from the Pfizer vaccine. Now here is FDA. FDA is gonna, they both had different data points. The public should know that we have multiple systems in place uh, to try to look for any potential safety signals uh, with the vaccines. And we really treat it as a system where we have these early warning uh, systems to try to know if there's uh, some hint that we need to further evaluate. And then we move on to do more rigorous uh, testing afterwards. So with the multiple systems in place, it, it is not at all surprising uh, that uh, we sometimes get signals in one system, but not in another. And we, we then need to do the hard work of evaluating it more rigorously. Thank you. Thank you. If I could just follow up to Dr. Forshee's um, comment and just, just reinforce what Dr. Forshee mentioned. I mean, our, our, our systems are designed to be sensitive to you know, to, to, to broadly capture potential safety concerns and to be able to, to rapidly assess those concerns. And I think what, what you heard this morning with the CDC 
and VSD presentation and the FDA presentation um, and the, the thoroughness in which um, these findings are being assessed demonstrates that the, the safety system works. And um, you basically saw that process in action um, working. And I think the public and the medical community um, should be confident that uh, the government uh, has the systems in place to rapidly detect potential safety problems and assess them. And we place a priority on communicating in a timely and transparent manner. But take no action. Okay, okay so uh, Dr. Gantz? I'm going to go to the front of the uh, this live stream. I had reminded this a little bit. So let's listen in to where they are now. Sure. sure. 12 and above. Uh, we're currently in the midst of our pediatric development. Uh, we were vaccinating down to children as young as two years of age currently in the U.S. Uh, with the uh, plan to escalate down to six months of age uh, after we hit the safety cohorts. Uh, I should say that uh, there's a, a pre-publication available on the archives from our partners uh, at Serum Institute of India, where, where they're publishing data uh, for their pediatric uh, study. And in India, the vaccines uh, authorized uh, above seven, age, uh, seven years of age. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Program. You know, if I, I if I could, I can take the um, the library question. Um, you know, we showed our library of, uh, of variant vaccines, which we add to every month um, based on our ongoing viral surveillance and and risk assessment. And this allows us. To I think she is Moderna's representative. Future strain selections. We, of course, also remain vigilant to be prepared to respond to an off cycle st um, strain selection for an immune evasive event. Last year, we produced the BA45 bivalent vaccine in 90 days, and that timeline is uh, aligned with FDA's proposal. And we um, can, we welcome continued conversations with FDA, this committee, and the CDC about future strain selection. Okay. And I hope you can hear them well. Dr. Program. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Dr. Perlman. Um, this is sort of a, a follow-up on, on Dr. Gans's question. Um, a little bit about the pediatric population. It feels like we're getting to a, a space where there is either people that are um, have received a number of at least a series of vaccines or have been infected by at least one strain of um, COVID at some point. But the pediatric population still remains different, especially the very young. And I'm curious, um, from the FDA's perspective, um, if we are to switch to a new strain or a new vaccine, a bivalent as the primary vaccine series, is there going to be an effort um, to um, do initial studies um, looking at these vaccine strains uh, or these vaccines um, and their efficacy in terms of primary vaccine series is what we saw a little bit in some of the Moderna data. And then as a second question, um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about the general population, but I'm curious how the FDA is going to be approaching immunosuppressed populations, um, particularly um, since the series um, and the number of vaccines given has been varied. Um, uh, over the past few years. years. Uh, and so uh, I'm curious how you're going to address that particular population in, 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 um, as we move forward with these vaccines and recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Forshee, I think that's yours. So um, I would uh, actually hope that some of my colleagues from OBR this is FDA. Able to contribute uh, to this as well. Um, so uh, is, uh, is let me see if I can mute myself. Available? Tell me if the whole thing got <laughs> muted or just this me. Is Peter Marks. Hey. So so th thanks thanks very much. So. Um, I, I think we we recognize that for the immunocompromised, and this is I think one of the this things we need to discuss uh, today. We've we've had a uh, you know we've had multiple uh, vaccines, and uh, and for the mRNA regimens right now, it's been an extra vaccine as part of the primary series, um, and whether that translates into uh, uh, two vaccines uh, per year or. or 
what it would for a, 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 an initial vaccination. I think that's something uh, that we, we'd like to have a discussion of and, and use the best available data that we have. Um, part of this is too, right, the immunocompromised are a real spectrum because uh, the, the modest immunocompromised of a diabetic compared to uh, the tremendous immunocompromise of somebody who's received uh, CD20 uh, depleting uh, therapies. Uh, there's real spectrum here that we're uh, we're dealing with. Over. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Berger. Hi. Thanks, Dr. Perlman. Uh, this is actually a, a holdover from this morning when Dr. Scopey gave her uh, presentation on epidemiology, what's going on currently. I really appreciate the information on hospitalization rates and um, you know, other, other impacts. And I was wondering if there were any granularity that, that the CDC has been collecting, for instance, on length of stay or, or, or at least severity uh, after hospitalization from this. Uh, I think one of the purposes here that you know, I think we're, we're hoping the vaccines can do is not you know, keep, keep the healthcare system system from being overwhelmed uh, and ensure that that capacity remains where it's needed. So it, it's just a real question about uh, what's what kind of granularity might be uh, available on hospitalization rates at the moment. I'm afraid Dr. Scobie wasn't able to make this, Dr. Jones. Uh, so for our hospitalization data, we do have uh, platforms such as uh, COVID. Now if I speak as well, do you get any echo? Uh, length of stay and uh, therapies given, ICU admission, oxygen, et cetera. And, and we are able to have and will have continue to uh, publish I put on the uh, headphones on, uh, to on that see data. if you don't get uh, For post-hospitalization, okay, no those would require different platforms. We have a number of platforms more looking specifically at uh, post-COVID conditions, which is perhaps a little bit different than what you're talking about. Um, so I think we, there may be, uh, which is something we haven't talked about a lot today, but that would be the main, one of the main focuses we're, we're looking at. Uh, hopefully that answers your question. Happy to clarify. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Gillen. Can you hear me? My camera's not working. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, two quite thanks. Uh, two questions. One for CDC, one for FDA. I think that the, the CDC is about timing. When in the calendar do we want to have, on a population basis, optimal protection? Again, this is the seasonality question. And because, and then with that, that then begs the question of when vaccines should be available, when vaccination should commence, uh, and and uh, incorporating waning. And then for the uh, the FDA about composition, the CDC data about the, the diversity of variants around the country is really quite revealing. And we didn't see anything about the rest of the world. And I guess that begs the question of, we, we've seen in the background documents about coordination with WHO, this has all been a, a US, maybe Northern Hemisphere conversations. How is this gonna happen with the rest of the world? Thanks. Apologies, I'm not sure who you want to answer the question, but just to CDC about seasonality, um, we have generally seen peaks uh, during the winter months, but there's certainly been interseasonal peaks as well. And I think additional data will be needed to be, uh, additional seasons will, will be needed. Uh, but I uh, agree with FDA's approach of uh, fall campaigns to uh, be in anticipation of maximum protection against both severe disease and infection uh, during uh, expected peak months during those uh, winter months. Ask, did, you, did you wound back the clock and said, had you had this in place with a June selection in the past two years with the September availability, how that would have played out? And is that the right, you know, how, what's, what's that look like? So is the question of how many additional perhaps hospitals? So the, qu the, qu the question is if this policy was in place three years ago, June selection, September vaccine availability. If you look at what was available, it took a snapshot in June 
and that vaccine showed up in September, how would that have worked um, for the fall and winter that followed? It would, it would be uh, likely take a fairly complex model to really uh, plan that out as far as, say, uh, uh, largely alpha and some delta uh, into a winter with delta and then Omicron and how vaccines focused on those antigens may or may not have uh, had improved protection over the uh, initial vaccine and and the same for uh, uh, the, the the following year, I think it's a fairly interesting and complicated question um, that we'd assume there'd be some improvement, but it's hard to anticipate exactly how much that would be. This is Peter Marks from the FDA perspective. I think that you know we there is we're starting to see some seasonality as um, uh, as was just now noted by Dr. Jones, and and I think we. We also see the potential uh, advantages to the winter seasonality uh, with a uh, fall campaign, because when do we have to worry about the worst overwhelming of the hospitals? It will be when we have influenza, RSV, and potentially COVID at the same time. And the advantage of this also is that um, uh, if we can see uh, influenza vaccine and the COVID-19 vaccines occurring, um, uh, at, at the same visit, again, it 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 it, it facilitates a vaccination program um, that may lead to more people uh, getting vaccinated and being protected um, uh, and reducing the amount of disease we see. So, I think that the overall um, this uh, seems like a reasonable way to go. I'll let Jerry a uh, weird comment as well, but we're very much. Um, uh, uh, of the mind that we would like to work with our global partners, including WHO uh, and uh, other regulatory agencies to make sure we're well coordinated here. Um, uh, it's just a matter that uh, not uh, every regulatory agency uh, and uh, WHO are not uh, perhaps at the same uh, place right at this very moment. Um, but ultimately we totally understand the need to um, have global surveillance cover global coverage of uh, these variants um, and, and ultimately good coordination with all of our partners. Yeah, this, this is Jerry. I, I think you pretty much covered it, Peter. Peter. Um, uh, one thing I will add is that um, the WHO does have a group that monitors variants and at least occasionally makes recommendations. Uh, they don't have a set schedule for when they do this. Uh, about six months ago, they did invite us to join that, and I think that, and we, we enthusiastically accept it, although it's still in the works to uh, for it to happen. But we will clearly participate in that if, 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 it, if we can work it out. Um, it, you're right, though, that unlike flu, uh, the global distribution of variants is more variable. Uh, and that's one reason I mentioned in my slides, I, I, I like that website that's called Covariance because you can click on every country. So and can you hear me as well? Time, how this differs. So, so going forward, it is still challenging. If variants don't sweep across the world quite uniform like they do, like they seem to with influenza. Uh, but yes, we'll continue to work with our partners uh, throughout the world as best we can, but our primary responsibility is what's best for the, the U.S. market, and that's where our focus will be. Over. Okay, thank you. I just want to make one comment. We we have a lot of questions. I'm not going to cut them off, but if co questions or comments, and they haven't been, but if there are going to be comments, can we just save them for the next section? Uh, because we, we're going to run out of uh, time. So, uh, Dr. Nelson. Thank you. I've got two questions. One for, is an extension of the last one regarding seasonality. So I appreciate the question from Dr. Gellin and Dr. Marx's remarks. I too had designed or hoped that we could design the release of the vaccine along with the influenza vaccine. But I noted from the data presented this morning and uh, previously that there is some seasonality. Yes, the predictable winter peak, but there also seems to be a late summer uh, mini surge as well 
if you will. Uh, my question to the CDC is, are these two peaks distinct or are they somehow connected and that perhaps targeting even the earlier peak may have some benefit in lowering the magnitude or severity of that second winter peak, which might make timing of release along with the influenza vaccine a little more challenging. And I'll ask my second question after the response. I think it's a little bit too early to really predict with certainty if there will continue to be a, a big peak and a small peak, we, I mean, compared to other pathogens, it's been a relatively recent, you know, just a couple, two, three years of, of data that we have to observe. Uh, as far as specifically is transmission from the smaller peak related to the greater peak, uh, well, uh, recency of infection does affect your ability to be protected from infection and therefore transmission. We do have transmission modeling uh, teams that are, are working on, on various questions and that's an interesting one for, for, our, for us to, to, to look at. Great. Thanks to the team for your aggressive approach and using multiple systems to identify signals and really providing some reassuring safety data for the vaccines that have been released to the public. Uh, my question is regarding some of those rare adverse events, one of my areas of interest. Um, can we also reassure the public and this committee, if you will, that there are mechanisms in place that look at not only signals across the entire population, but identifying more rare adverse events and whether there are subpopulations with enhanced risk uh, that we might be able to identify. I think this is a good question to generally figure out if there is a population that, that is at risk of injury. So, I think I can make a, a, a general comment that, you know, in 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 our VAR system, um, we we do monitor again for all adverse events, and we um, we 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 do attempt to at least for for serious adverse events, we attempt to follow up and get additional medical records and information, which may shed light on the the condition of these of of of, of the individuals experiencing the adverse event. Um, if, if there were particular concerns in subgroups, I think um, ultimately we would probably have to do um, epi studies um, to, 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 to look in those, in those specific subgroups. But um, in, in our monitoring for serious rare adverse events, we, we do attempt to get as much clinical information as possible to assess comorbidities and, and existing conditions. And I would just add that um, we do have a good bit of experience working with uh, some very rare adverse events in our vaccine safety monitoring. Um, in our flu safety surveillance, for example, we, we regularly monitor uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is um, a, a very rare uh, outcome. And so we've been able to detect risks um, below one in 100,000 uh, in terms of attributable uh, risk. So because of the size of some of the systems that we use, uh, we are able to um, accurately estimate what the risks are for low risks or for subpopulations. And, and we have examples with previous uh, vaccines where we've demonstrated that capability. And a lot of this has been done in conjunction with the CDC. Yeah, I appreciate let me just quickly follow up. I had mentioned previously our clinical immunization safety assessment network. So that, that's a collaboration between CDC and, and academic medical centers and medical research centers and with access to um, specialists and subspecialists where if we do get uh, an in, at the individual level, we do get a, a, a report of an adverse event in a patient um, um, in, in a, in a with, 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 a, with a comorbidity um, or an existing condition, we do have the ability to um, do in-depth clinical reviews of those cases and get feedback from our specialists. 
Yeah, I'm very familiar with the great work of the CISA and its origins in my former position of the Department of Defense. And uh, I think it highlights the like communication each other. problem that we've had and that we're great at identifying the absence of big signals and not really fortifying that with, yes, we continue to look for those rare signals. And yes, individual events occur, but this not is a very to the point where that, which yeah, there needs to be a change in recommendations. So thank anything. you all for your great work. Okay. So at this point, can people try to have just a single question because we're really running out of time? Uh, Dr. Bernstein. Sure. I had two questions, but I'll stick to one. Uh, as you said, and maybe ask the other uh, later. So, uh, there's been a lot of emphasis on neutralizing antibodies, but personally, I think more T-cell data would be uh, incredibly helpful. And that being said, is it known what the ideal amount of antigenic uh, content and from which strains are needed for durable T cell uh, memory by age? Because we're talking about, it's been mentioned about even having a bivalent vaccine for the primary series, especially in young children. And I certainly would not want to I would still want to maintain the T cell this memory is a good question to say with T -cells whatever can be. Uh, vaccine plan we put in place. Uh, this is Jerry. Um, you were breaking up a little bit, but I think I got all of it. Uh, the short oh, answer is <laughs> that's all right. The short answer is no. It's not known. Um, and one other thing everyone needs to keep in mind is. A T cell response is a broad term. Um, I don't even think we know whether the T cell response is a CD4 yeah, T cell so, response, a CD8 a response. Um, there's even, uh, I'm just saying there's a lot that's unknown, but the how much of that would contribute to protection and how it contributes to protection, I think there's just so many unknowns still, unfortunately. I do think it's making a difference, though. I think it's what pre is preventing people from... Uh, nobody, ar no, nobody argues that. <laughs> nobody argues that. I think we all agree that it's important. The real question is, what is its relative role, and how do you measure it if you really want to, to know how it contributes, especially to something like severe disease to or to know that. that sort of thing. It's just really hard to know at this point in time. Uh, Dr. Cohen, yeah, I need to. Thanks. I had a related question. It's not our well, job. To to yeah. yeah. to those things. It is I their job. One for later. Yeah, we have we'll have discussion time. Dr. Cohen, okay. I have um, one question for the companies specifically. I was wondering if you guys could talk a little bit more about immunization in very young children, and if you guys are planning or thinking about doing anything like um, different schedules and different lengths between doses to align more in the long term with our routine immunization schedule, or if there would be an advantage of having some space, some better spacing between the doses to allow for um, better T cell responses. Yes, maybe I'll take it first. So we do have a. Um, um, a study called Baby Cove. It is this going is to be, it, it started enrolling and we're dose ranging right now. It's an in infant's three to five months of age. And we are using that eight week interval to try to align with a kind of a routine pediatric vaccinations uh, schedule. And so we're, we're going to select a dose and then we'll get into the placebo controlled part of the study. Are we on? Right. So. Yes. Okay. Great. So we we are so are also this evaluating in children uh, uh, six months to less than five years of age, both the current dose regimen uh, for the three microgram bivalent vaccine, but also extended intervals. You know, we started um, in at the early days of the pandemic uh, with that original schedule. So we're further studying uh, the longer intervals to see if there's any uh, impact on the immunity as well. Okay, thank you. Dr. Reingold? 
Uh, yeah, hi, can you hear me? Uh, so quick question in terms of what the package is that companies will be required to submit. Uh, you know, in the real world, uh, telling people like me the need to come in on separate dates for their flu shot and their COVID shot is certainly not going to improve coverage. Um, and so are you going to require data about, uh, I don't care if you use the word co-administration, concurrent administration, concomitant administration, but administration of the two vaccines on the same day? Thanks. Um, this is Jerry again. Um, that is probably not something that I typically we would put in a package for an authorization or an approval of a strain change supplement. We certainly don't do it for influenza. On the other hand, those type of studies do get done at some point. Uh, I guess I would have to say we, we'll, we'll discuss it further about what type of studies like that would be needed from manufacturers if this becomes a major issue. I don't know if Dr. Marks or uh, somebody else wants to add into to this. So, so this is Peter Marks. I, I just want to, um... I would, I would just add that uh, we will be doing uh, formal epidemiologic studies on co-administration of influenza vaccine with, um, uh, with the COVID-19 vaccines in large databases. I think we'll have real world evidence. Um, we may also have uh, some companies that are studying these together. And I think point very, very well taken uh, that I think uh, as we move into the next fall, uh, ideally, again, given um, that we, we're a little bit lackluster in our ability to get uh, even the adult population uh, vaccinated with uh, boosters this uh, fall. Uh, that uh, even and even the older adult population that uh, being able to uh, have the data so that we can do concomitant um, flu and COVID vaccination may be very helpful. So we'll take that back. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Meisner. Thank you, Dr. Perlman. Um, and I've got, I've selected the most important question because I've, uh, several of them have, uh, have built up here. And I'd like to respond to, to Dr. Beigel's presentation, which was, uh, I thought very helpful. And, uh, as well as his presentation at the NIH symposium, uh, a week or two ago. So, but, and I'm not sure if he's still on, but I, I will present the question. Do we um, do we really want to stop asymptomatic infections by SARS-CoV-2? Um, first of all, I don't think that's a reasonable objective, at least with the current generation of um, messenger RNA vaccines. Um, and you can certainly make the argument that um, an asymptomatic infection is desirable because it will uh, stimulate both cellular and humoral immunity. No COVID is uh, it will kind of act like its own boost. So uh, to me, we certainly want to stop the virus from circulating, but that's probably not going to be possible because the vaccine as clever as it is, is always going to mutate and evolve and at least indefinitely uh, find ways of um, avoiding uh, our, 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 the immunity that, that humans uh, build up. So is that, I, is, do you really think that should be an objective of the vaccines? Over. Yeah, so I think that's a great question for the discussion. But John, if you want to say something briefly to answer that. Well, I was just going to say it's probably more than a, a discussion, more than we can accomplish uh, today. Um, uh, certainly decreasing the overall community load. Uh, we're, uh, if, if you decrease asymptomatic infection, you decrease transmission, you can decrease that community load. I think that is the intent. Um, there are some... Uh, uh, at least theoretical benefits as we've articulated, and I think how you balance this is those actually not possible with these vaccines. Discussion. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, 
Yes, yeah, so I wanted to follow up um, a little bit on this uh, question of uh, giving the flu vaccine and the COVID vaccine at the same time. While I recognize that will probably increase um, adherence or uptake, um, one of the things that struck me, maybe something CDC can address this, is when I looked at the stroke data, I was sort of left with a question. I know most of the people I think got the COVID vaccine um, probably in close proximity temporally to the flu vaccine, but um, is there any Very reason to believe question. that spreading That's those what I've been out temporally might reduce the stroke risk. Thank you. So the 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 the, the findings that were presented this morning um, on 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 concomitant um, bivalent and flu vaccine um, were, were actually um, a a a post hoc uh, supplemental analysis that was part of the original signal detection. Um, I, th there, there may be other reasons besides vaccination. While we're for for observing those findings, like unmeasured confounding or bias or other potential health systems issues, so I don't think that the evidence are sufficient to conclude that there's a, a, an association there. And um, given that, um, I, I think um, talking about um, spacing out the vaccines may be a bit premature at this time. And I'll just rec just reinforce that CEC's recommendations he cracks for me COVID up. vaccination yep. and for flu vaccination ha have not changed. Thank you. Okay, thank and you. I would just quickly agree with Dr. Shiva Pekoro. Um, we are going to be doing um, a more formal epidemiological study in Medicare to explore that question. Uh, you know why they don't want to say it? Because they're saying that if we ask people to come twice, now. then they will not come for the vaccine. Thank you. Dr. Kim? Well, thank you, Dr. Berman. Uh, most of the discussions we've had today uh, have, revolved, uh, have revolved around the messenger RNA vaccine. Uh, but we did have uh, the uh, Novavax also present. And I, I have a question for Novavax and a question for FDA. Uh, FDA, uh, what, what, what's the position, FDA's position, uh, and, and also this disposition on the on the Novavax's uh, protein subunit vaccine and uh, and and uh, for Novavax, uh, what is your current position on on uh, how the, how your vaccine can be used in in the context of today's discussion? Right. So so maybe I'll jump in first. I mean, we we are approved in the U.S. for primary a series as well as for boosting. Right now, there's there are no more individuals who need primary uh, series, at least in most are talking about young children. Uh, so we, we think we're a, a really important tool for boosting uh, in this upcoming season. And that's how we think we should be used. And we think that, that there's data I showed you today actually supports use of our vaccine this as a booster, no just because of the breadth of the immune response we induce. And we will be getting future variants from whatever strain is selected. We can't chase the strains. So in our opinion, it's better to use uh, a vaccine that can induce these broad responses against the variants that will eventually emerge. Okay, thank you. Does anyone want to address it from the uh, FDA so, side? This is Jerry. I, I, I thought Dr. Kim just asked what our position was on Novavax. Was, did I miss part of the question? What is uh, what? What are your thoughts, considerations for the Novavax's uh, protein subunit vaccine uh, in the context of what we're talking about in terms of primary series and booster? Well, we have already authorized, as you just heard, we've authorized Novavax for emergency use. So I guess that's our position. Uh, you heard today they were, they say they are able to. Uh, if, if a recommendation comes from this committee to update and change the vaccine, they said they are able and willing to do that. So I guess that's our position that they would do that if, if the committee makes a, a new recommendation. So I'm not sure what else to tell you, except that we've authorized them and that's where we are today. Okay, thank you. Dr. Sawyer. Yeah, I have a question for the manufacturers. It relates to the timing of strain selection and, and the distribution of a new product. And the specific question is, are, are, if each of the manufacturers could let us know 
uh, if they're headed towards single dose vial distribution or single dose distribution, this is going to be particularly important as we move from government funded vaccine to privately purchased vaccine. In my community, most pediatricians only offer the vaccine on a few day, specific days of the week or times of the day so that they don't waste product by opening a 10 dose file and not having enough patients to use that. And that's despite advice that it's okay to do. And it certainly will not happen if the pediatricians have to purchase vaccine uh, and then use up a vial on the same day that it's opened. Uh, so uh, we heard, you know, at least one of the manufacturers has gotten to two dose vials, I think. I'm wondering what the future plans are and whether the 100 day timeline projected for mRNA from strain selection to product delivery would hold up if we needed single dose files. So could each of the manufacturers very briefly answer that question? Sure, I can take it first from from Moderna. We we are we certainly hear you, and we are um, moving towards single dose vials and pre filled syringes just to facilitate just that. And we do think we can uh, achieve that in the timeline outlined. Okay. Pfizer. Maybe I'll take it next. So Dr. Swanson here. So similarly, we'll be transitioning from the multi-dose file to the single dose file going forward uh, and can support that with the future vaccine updates. Thank you. Dr. Dubovsky, do you? Yeah, it's, it's a similar situation. We're heading toward a unit dose file and we're, we're aiming to get to a pre syringe uh, shortly after that. Okay. Great, thanks very much. Thank you. Dr. McGinnis? Uh, hello, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so this, I, I, I have this comment that I'm going to restrict to this particular phase of things. So I guess this is directed for Jerry uh, Weir. So Jerry, I think we kind of move into this discussion that, um, can you see me? That um, COVID is kind of like flu, but actually COVID isn't like flu in many ways, except it's waves. And we tend to try to treat it like flu. And we think we can have a periodicity of the response, but actually bringing in to operationalize how you might do that is actually the challenge. So. I, I see the suggestion that maybe by June is the good time to do, and it may be, it may be a perfectly fine time, but it seems to leave a very short time for manufacturers who manufacture both vaccines um, in order to get both of them on the dock. So I'm trying to, I'm sort of very, very sympathetic, by the way. Um, I don't have to operationalize this, but, um, COVID is not flu as an infection or a disease. So I'm wondering how you see being able to build in an operationalized periodicity versus the need to have a decision and move and how much flexibility the manufacturers have. So I'm sorry, that's a difficult question. Yeah, it's <laughs> um, well, to start off, one of the reasons we asked the manufacturers to come to this meeting was to tell us how much time they need. So actually, I heard something today that I hadn't heard before today, and that was exactly how much time a protein-based manufacturer would need. We may have to go back and rethink this as far as the timing. Uh, as I said earlier, I put this out there as a placeholder. We would say we we had an N of one this past year. We did it in June. Um, it seemed to work okay. Uh, but, you know, I think, uh, Dr. McGinnis, we're all just going to have to maintain flexibility. Yep. You're right. There's not, yep. there's not a good, pa there's not a good pattern yet. There's, there's, there's hints of pattern. Right. And, and I think we'll just do that. We will look at this and we'll try to be flexible. We'll try to work with manufacturers to, to keep and, and get as many manufacturers on the market as we can, because 
you and I have been through flu for I don't know how many years. I mean, having options is important, and you never know which one you're going to need. So we'll, we'll continue to do this. I think you know we'll be flexible, and, and we'll work with them as best we can. Thank you, Jerry. It's okay. not flu, though. We agree, right? <laughs> So I'm the first one to say <laughs> you can, take, you can take some lessons from it, but no, it's going to be different. There are different viruses. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Chatterjee? Yes, thank you, Dr. Perlman. My question is for uh, the vaccine manufacturers. So uh, during the open public hearing, we heard about a uh, combination influenza um, COVID-19 vaccine product that's been um, uh, evaluated by a company. And I was just curious to hear from um, you all whether uh, you are developing this type of product as well and where you are in the development phase for those. Maybe I'll start. This is uh, Dr. Swanson from Pfizer. So we have initiated uh, studies to evaluate the combination of flu uh, COVID uh, vaccines and are in early studies uh, for that. And as with all of our prior clinical studies, you know, robust safety assessments are part of that uh, trial as well. Thank you. And this is um, um, this is Rita Das from Moderna, and we, we have uh, initiated a phase one trial for co combination COVID and flu vaccines. Thank you. Thank you. Earlier this year, we announced data from our initial studies uh, for a combination product as well, and we just started a, a phase two study uh, for combination influenza, a part of LN plus COVID, uh, and, and we're anticipating that that data is going to be available kind of mid-year to make a go no go decision on how to go forward. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we're going to stop this part of the uh, the meeting and go into discussion. So, do we have? Um, so, I'm not sure. If, do the sponsors and CDC and FDA stay on the line for this, or how do we work this? We 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 do stay on the line. Um, okay, this is <laughs> uh, and uh, and that allows if and this will allow uh, the. Uh, Committee members, if need be, to to ask additional questions, although that's not the primary purpose. Um, so uh, uh, I think we can get the uh, the questions up here. Uh, I'll turn it over uh, to uh, Dr. Caslow. So the question should be: Should we separate flu and Pfizer? Right. Thank you. We, so let's go ahead and put the first uh, voting question up, or the voting instead question instead of Pfizer. Um, Let's see what their questions okay. are. So the voting question is, is, does the committee recommend harmonizing the vaccine strain composition of primary series and booster doses in the United States to a single com com comp composition? For example, the composition for all vaccines administered currently would be a bivalent vaccine, original plus Omicron BA4, BA5. So no more okay, so that, just So we minute. will discuss this voting question for the next hour or so, and uh, we'll have hopefully uh, answer all the questions. I, I guess, uh, Dr. Perlman, I think maybe it, maybe it's probably easiest to take these hour? questions in succession and, and start with the, uh, the voting question and then go to the discussion questions. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's what I was planning to do. And then we'll read the uh, discussion questions in about an hour and spend, hopefully spend the last hour on that. We will probably go over our 5.30 deadline and uh, go of, up to possibly 6 o'clock because if we need the time. If we don't, that's fine too. So Dr. Meisner. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Um I had my I had a question for the <laughs> on the last session. I, I was because the risk of stroke seemed to be uh associated with adjuvant or high dose influenza and I, I I wanted to ask how they the manufacturers are going to address that uh that issue but since we're in the next session um let i i think this proposal uh by uh dr weir uh, uh, is 
uh, is reasonable. I think that certainly the uh, the vaccine strain sh should be harmonized among the different um, uh, manufacturers. And but the issue of how frequently um, they should be administered is hard to say with precision at at this particular point. I think we need to uh, see what happens with disease uh burdens that is um we may or may not need um uh, annual vaccination I, it's just awfully early uh, it seems to me in in this process uh to answer that um to answer that question and the, the last point i want to make is people spoke a lot about correlates of immunity in deciding on how well or how effective uh, the vaccines are. And as has been pointed out several times, it's very hard to disentangle uh, humoral immunity from T cells, from natural killer cells, from FC uh, effector functions of, of, of antibodies. So I don't, th I'm not sure that, that serology is the only issue. I think we really need to look at um, rates of disease, and I think it's important for uh, the CDC to continue to provide evidence regarding uh, deaths and hospitalizations that are that are truly uh, uh, caused by COVID nineteen rather than just associated with uh, hospitalization. Right. So. Um, I just I, I would be careful about placing too much emphasis on uh, serology. Over. I have been saying we should look at okay. the clinical you, data Dr. instead Bernstein. of serologies. Thanks. Can you hear me? He's saying that look at hospitalization instead of just saying we have more yes. antibodies oh, or great. less antibodies. Okay. Thanks. So I I. Um, believe we still need to vaccinate the uh, unvaccinated. And so anything that results in better public communication would be extremely uh, valuable. That being said, and this has been brought up by others uh, in the course of the day is, how should outcome expectations be prioritized for the COVID vaccine program in making these kinds of uh, decisions? Realistically, I don't think we can have it all. Less infection, less transmission, less severe disease, and less long COVID. And that seems to be a major challenge for public messaging. So I was wondering how we prioritize for the program. Yeah, so one thing is this, uh, this sounds like it's an important point. Uh, this part of the session, I think we should concentrate on the vaccine composition. Uh, I don't know if you is, you, do you, is your comment relevant for that? Well, I think, well, if we were going to, I'm not clear that that uh, using a bivalent in the younger pediatric age group uh, makes the most sense. But we can talk about it later if you don't think it's relevant. I yeah, yeah, no, I don't, it's hard for me to know. Uh, Dr. Offit? Right, thank you. So, so um, I, I certainly support this, um, would support this. Uh, the reason I would support it is, is I do think it's important to get closer to the strains that are circulating for certain groups. So, so I mean, right now, BA4 is gone. BA5 probably represents less than one, less than 5% of what's circulating, but certainly a lot closer than, than, than uh, Wuhan is. And I think for the goal is to keep people out of the hospital. That's the goal, you know, to, to not overwhelm hospitals. And I think for some people who are so medically frail that a mild infection could land them in the hospital. So I think it is important to try and get closer to the strains that are circulating. I agree with that. I also think that, that when we talk about those high risk groups, whether it's people who have multiple comorbidities or people who are elderly or people who, uh, who are immune compromised, there are a number of those people who aren't going to make a good immune response. I mean, I just had my 94 year old mother receive a booster dose. I think she's probably not making a very good immune response. And I do think we, we should 
always, always make the point about uh, giving antivirals. And hopefully there's an oral form of remdesivir that's around the corner. That'll be good. But and then the second issue in turn is protecting against severe disease for just the general population. I think we already have that vaccine um, in, in the Wuhan one strain. And, and so any and any of those would work because, again, these T cell, I think T cells are important. And there are a number of researchers like, you know, Jerry Ware and Alessandro Setti and, and uh, Daniela Weisskopf at Scripps and, and uh, John Weary at our place at Penn, who I think have, have made it fairly clear that there, there, there's a role for T cells in that. And there it's like win-win, which is, so there, I don't, that does not fit the flu model for me. So, so vaccinating everybody every year, as distinct from flu, where you really do need to be strain specific. I mean, when we miss, and, and we've missed on H3N2, a miss is a mile. And, and um, if we miss with the, the vaccine strain and people get the vaccine and it doesn't match the circulating strain, you have pretty much no protection. Whereas that's not true with this virus. Um, as uh, Dr. McGinnis said, I mean, this isn't flu and you do have still have protection against severe disease. So I think we need to define what we want from this vaccine, but I certainly support this, uh, this uh, voting question the way it's uh, written. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Dr. Sawyer? Much I understand what I wanted to present what's happening of, here. Uh, harmonizing the composition. The voting question doesn't include a time frame. I do have some anxiety about the amount of data in under two year olds with a primary series with the bivalent doses. It sounded like Pfizer had 90 patients, and I, I, Moderna presented a little data on a similarly small number. So I guess my question is for FDA, how much data do we need to recommend a bivalent primary series for young children? Does someone from the FDA want to address that? Sorry about that delay. Um, so so thank, thanks for that question. I think we'll be looking at the totality of the data that we have um, some of the data uh, from the mRNA vaccine is mutually reinforcing in terms of uh, helping us uh, in terms of numbers. We agree that the numbers right now are small. Hopefully, as additional data come in, um, we will uh, have a larger data set in this, um, in this age range. Um, the, I think that the, the reassuring thing, though, uh, is been the safety that we have, the safety profile that we have seen with the bivalent boosters is it mirrors um, uh, it very well um, the uh, or the original vaccine in this age range. So again, we this is like a lot of the questions we've we've had today. The answer is we will need more data. Um, we obviously care about the safety uh, first and foremost in this age range. Um, uh, but um, I think ultimately the overall thought here um, is that getting towards one vaccine composition. Uh, for everyone will ultimately be uh, much uh, much more helpful. Um, and it also avoids exposing the youngest children uh, to antigens that don't ex really exist in the real world anymore. Thanks. Dr. Berger? Hi, thanks. I I want to say overall, I think I, I agree um, completely with Dr. Offit here. I, I think our, our our job here is really to protect against severe disease. And you know, I think what we heard this morning was 16 times lower risk of hospitalization, 13 times lower risk of death when you're comparing to unvaccinated. Um, it really makes a difference if you can actually have a strain that's matched to the currently circulating um, you know, strains themselves. Um, and, and what we're trying to do is really offer that best for protection possible. And I think it makes sense to um, you know, simplify this process, have a skill composition. I, you know, I do think that there are questions still that remain um, unanswered, such as dosage amounts, uh, you know, especially in the pediatric populations, as we were just discussing. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm supportive of the question itself. I, I think the only thing that I, I kind of wish it stopped at that single composition and didn't give the, for example, I understand that's the currently, you know, current composition would be this bivalent, bivalent version, but we already know that that's those, those strains are actually circulating out. So I think there are still questions about whether the original strain, the, the Wuhan strain would need to be included in that. Um, you know, certainly BA4 and BA5 are questions, whether we should be switching over to different ones at this point. I, I think all that remains to be said uh, or to be uh, determined, but overall, I think a uh, movement towards a single composition makes sense uh, to simplify this process. That's all. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, Dr. McGinnis. I'm gonna, I had originally uh, four questions. One I've already addressed to Jerry. So I'm moving to number three. And I think our challenge here is, you know, have the bivalent boosters um, added any data to the monovalent? I think that's sort of something that we have failed to articulate. Um, obviously, BA5 is closer to Wuhan. So where is all this noise coming from? So I think we don't have randomized comparisons to demonstrate protection against severe disease. And I think it's a really problematic message uh, for the community. I am not a public health vaccine person, but you know, I give the little example of two adult children who are both musicians for vaccines. They move to Nashville, they go out one night and they get uh, three days later, they're symptom symptomatic. So I, and they were pretty sick. And one of those was a bivalent booster. So all I can say to them is, well, imagine how sick you would have got if you hadn't had these vaccines. And that's not a great message to try to deliver. So I believe we should move from this, what was the circulating strain to a more contemporary strain, but you may still get reinfected. So I, um, I think that is a real challenge and the message is that you would have gotten more sick and land in the hospital. You know, it resonates with me, but I'm not sure it resonates with the recipients of the disease. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Dr. Gantz. Thanks so much. Um, I think um, part of the issue that people are having with this is vaccine composition. That's a big issue that everyone has raised multiple issues related and I think will be dealt with in the questions and how we pick um, you know which particular strain would be in an upcoming vaccine. I think this question really should be vaccine harmonization and in that I think there's a lot of agreement that um, what we need to do here is really um, think about how we're moving until we get to that next stage. So what are we doing for the primary would be the same as what we're recommending for the um, the booster. And I completely agree with that. And I do think it is important um, for us to realize that, um, you know, everyone talks about death and severe disease. I mean, maybe this can be included in severe disease as the primary outcomes, but I have to tell you, we're seeing more and more children with co-infections, with COVID plus COVID, and they're definitely more severe than if they had either or, and so I do think the protection is broader than what people are identifying as the only marker. Um, there is definitely disease that is happening as a result of infection with these viruses and particularly in our youngest children. And so I agree that we have to get closest to what is circulating. The ones we have right now are the examples that have been laid out here. And so I would support this and I just think we're, confusing people by saying composition and not harmonization. And then therefore we can move on to the next discussion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Wharton. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I, I am supportive of this question. Uh, I do think there are some data gaps that it will be good to get more information on. Um, I'm, I'm glad that there's more information uh, expected about uh, optimal dosage for children. And there's some questions about different dosages for say the primary series and booster for the Moderna vaccine for adults. There's some, there's some unanswered questions and some things to work out, but I think this is absolutely the right thing to do for the program. It will, uh, it will make things simpler. And um, I, you know, I know how we ended up this way, but I, I think this is a, a good decision to make and I'm supportive of it. Okay, thank you. Dr. Cohn. Thank you. I'll just uh, echo what Dr. Wharton just said. I think this is a very uh, good decision to move forward with this from a programmatic perspective and from an implementation perspective. 
I just I, I I would be remiss to not uh, acknowledge that the the most concerning data point that I saw this whole day was that extremely low vaccination coverage in uh, six months to two years of age and also two years to four years of age. Uh, so we have to do much, much better in anything we can do from a simplification perspective, from a um, from an optimization of the of the of the of those doses in the future. We're just going to have more kids aging into this age group and needing to be vaccinated. And uh, we really just uh, have to focus on getting those kids vaccinated. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hawkins. Oh, yes, thank you. So I support this approach. Um, I think vaccine effectiveness is confirmed. Vaccine safety is confirmed, notwithstanding discussions about uh, pericarditis, myocarditis, and the need for so not so common things that occur. Uh, the average U.S. consumer, vaccinated or not, has accepted COVID-19 is going to be with us for a while. Uh, most, I believe, are hopeful that science will positively affect the trajectory of this condition, and they want us to be successful. Uh, many consumers are accepting of the annual influenza vaccine. I think they'll have a variability in multiple vaccine uh, administrations, such as multiple COVID boosters, might lead to uh, more vaccine uh, hesitancy, vaccine fatigue, and or, con and or concerned about uh, FDA reliability, CDC reliability. I'm not a researcher, but finally, I would reemphasize previous comments about the need for processes and protocols to fill a knowledge gap to help us make better decisions about next steps. Thank you. Dr. Gowan? Oh, my camera's still not working, thanks. Um, so you know, we can't keep doing what we're doing, so we have to, we have to move on. Um, we clear, it's been articulated in every one of these meetings that despite how good these vaccines are, we need better vaccines. And thank you, John, for a great presentation about some of that pathway to get there. I think this is a reasonable approach. This is not, we have to keep reminding ourselves this is not influenza. And we, we can't, we need to keep paying attention to that to make sure that we don't just follow that dogma because we're used to doing it. Um, and that as we move in, this is, a, we'll try this this time. I don't think we're setting it in stone and we'll see how it goes. We may need to adjust along the way, but overall, I think this is a good path forward. Okay, thank you, Dr. McGinnis. Dan, are you gonna have discussion after the vote or all the discussion before? No, we're going to have uh, the vote, then we'll have a discussion about the vote and then we'll have another discussion about- All right, I have nothing to say, thank you. Okay, so at this point, with I think we've ended our discussion and I'm going to uh, briefly turn this over to Dr. Pedar uh, to describe the voting process. Great, thank you, Dr. Perlman. Um, um, our, um, only our 10 regular members and 11 temporary voting members, a total of 21, will be voting in today's meeting with regards to the voting process. Um, Dr. Perlman will read the final voting question for the record and afterwards, um, I'll ask all regular voting members to cast their votes by selecting one of the three voting options, which include yes, no, or abstain. Uh, you will have one minute to cast your vote. Um, after the question is read, please note that once you've um, cast your vote, you may change your vote within the one minute time frame. I'll announce when the voting poll has closed. At that point, all votes will be considered final. Once all the votes have been um, tallied, we'll broadcast the results and read the individual votes aloud for the public record. Does anyone have um, any questions related to the voting process before we begin? Okay, if there are no questions, I'll ask Dr. Perlman um, to please go ahead and read the voting questions one more time for the record. So the question is, does the committee recommend harmonizing the vaccine strain composition of primary series and booster doses in the US to a single composition? For example, the composition of all vaccines administered currently would be a bivalent vaccine. Uh, original strain plus Omicron BA.4, BA.5. So no more monovalent. And right. I'm sorry, is there an and missing here? Where? After primary series and booster doses. 
I don't see that on my screen. Oh, oh that's probably because um, you have probably raised hand uh, block open on your right hand side. There is an. I don't care there. as long as there's an and there. I'm okay. Thank yes, you. Yep, it an is. There is an and. There. Yeah, yeah. Susan, this is Prabha. Do you want to talk about moving uh, members? Yes, I was just about to do that problem. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Sure. Thank you so much for the reminder. Um, yes, at this point, before uh, now that the voting question has been read by Dr. Perlman, what we will do, we will move all the voting members and the DFO. Um, um, everyone will stay in the room. Everyone who's not voting will be moving out of the room. Um, and uh, please just stay put. Do not disconnect from your Zooms. Stay patient with us for two to four minutes while we conduct the votes and we come back. And at that point, I'll read the votes aloud for everyone to see. So um, non-voting members, you will be transitioned into another room. Thank you. Derek, please let me know when all the voting members... So while they are doing this, I will do a separate discussion of what data they found. They did find statistically significant data, but they're ignoring it saying for strokes that it is only one system and all agencies didn't find it and all systems didn't see it. So we continue. So I'll have that discussion separately. And of course, by we, I mean the FDA, CDC, and the folks. I think they'll return and vote. I think they'll vote openly. I don't know if they changed it. This is uh, looking at a comment. This is another disappointment I have is that they seem to be saying that we don't have sufficient data. We have to look, look at more um, clinical outcomes. We've had the vaccines for a long time now. There is ample data if they want to collect and see and work with it. So it seems strange to me when they continue to say we don't have enough data. So just a quick note, um, one of the commenters here is continuing to insult people who are taking vaccine. I over here do not like to call names to anyone and their decisions. So I would recommend that you don't do it.
I gave a warning I had to block him. This was just unexpectedly I started this. So of course moderators do not know it, but I am moderating, I'm blocking. <laughs> Again, as long as we can be civil to each other and have a good discussion, I'm fine with that. But uh, just don't call names to each other. That's not cool. At least not cool within Cool Bean community. Usually, do not respond in the live discussions. We'll talk another time. <laughs> yes, I have the wrench. <laughs> Can I, um, is everything ready for display? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, okay, so we have a unanimous vote, 21 out of 21 uh, voted yes. Um, now I'm here, uh, I'm gonna read uh, one by one uh, for the public record, if we could have Excel. They did do a vote separately, but they're gonna tell us who voted what. Great, thank you, Derek. Um, I'm going to read um, from top to bottom. Uh, it's not alphabetically organized, so um, here we go. Um, Dr. Haley Gans, yes. Dr. Amanda Cohn, yes. Dr. Mark Sawyer, yes. Dr. Ofer Levy, yes. Dr. Steve Hergam, yes. Dr. Paul Offit, yes. Dr. Stanley Perlman, yes. Dr. Mike Nelson, yes. Dr. Archana Chatterjee, yes. Dr. Bruce Gellin, yes. Dr. Pamela McInnes, yes. Dr. Randy Hawkins, yes. Dr. Adam Berger, yes. Dr. Cody Meissner, yes. Dr. Janet Lee, yes. Dr. David Kim, yes. Dr. Melinda Wharton, yes. Dr. Arthur um, Rheingold, yes. Dr. Henry Bernstein, yes. Dr. James Hildreth, yes. And finally, Dr. Eric Rubin, yes. Thanks everyone for your patience as I read. Um, I'll now hand over this conclusive voting portion for today's meeting, and now I hand over the meeting back over to Dr. Perlman for asking the committee for their uh, voting explanation. Thanks so much, everyone. Yeah, so the next component of this is we go to, I ask everyone on the panel why they voted the way they did. Given that we've already had a great discussion about this and uh, lots of positive feedback, this doesn't have to be long, so I'm going to do this in alphabetical order. So. That uh, means that Dr. Bernstein, you start. And if your explanation, you think you've said it already, you can say, I've said it already, but or say what you want. Do they need it? You're wasting time now. Perhaps he's muted. Does he still have to speak up? Dr. Burns? I, uh, I'm sorry. I thought you were doing Dr. Berger. Oh, no, he, he lost that by <laughs> you one were doing letter. Dr. Berger. But you're first. <laughs> okay. I, yeah, I, I mentioned it before. I mean, I think anything that results in a better public communication to get more of the 
unvaccinated, vaccinated uh, would be extremely valuable. I still have some questions, but I think this is the right direction. Okay. So, Dr. Berger, you actually should have been first, and I apologize to Dr. Bernstein for that. But oh, Dr. sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I thought you had called out Dr. Bernstein, so I was not responding either. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah I did. It was my mistake. <laughs> I, I, it's the same rationale that I gave before. I think, you know, as, as Dr. Bernstein just, just noted, you know, we should be on FDS better, site uh, live you know, as better well. vaccination rate here. I'm actually and, and from the in the process. You know, the, the information that we heard early this morning, again, um, you know, 16 times lower hospitalization, 13 times lower death against, uh, you know, compared to those that are unvaccinated. I think those numbers kind of speak for itself. Um, so I, I'm, I'm definitely supportive of simplifying the process, harmonizing uh, the, the vaccine composition between primary and, and boosters. Dr. Chatterjee. Thank you, Dr. Bowman. Um, Speaking with colleagues, friends, family, questions I'm answering from the community, there's so much confusion about these different formulations that I think anything we can do to um, ease up on that confusion and simplify things, it's, it's going to be a good thing. I concur with my other colleagues that there definitely remains a need uh, for these vaccines and for us to do our best to uh, get them into arms. Having vaccines is not sufficient. We need to have them be used. Um, and so uh, I voted yes, um, because I think this is a step in the right direction and getting us there. I'm not sure Dr. we Gantz. need this commentary afterwards. Thank you. Um, I stated some of my um, thought process earlier, and um, so I'm not going to repeat those. I continue to believe that. The one thing that I do think it's important to state is this isn't only a convenience thing to um, increase the number of people who are vaccinated, which I agree with my colleagues is extremely important for all the evidence that was related. But I also think moving towards the strains that are circulating is very important. So I would say that the science also supports this move. Um, and you do see, I know there's a lot of controversy um, about this, but it does seem that much of the data points in the same direction as Dr. Weir says that these are additive and um, I think hopefully will help people get on board. Dr. Kim. Oh, thank you. I, I, I'm totally convinced that the bivalent vaccine is beneficial as, as primary series and as boosters. Um, furthermore, the updated vaccine safety data are, are really encouraging so far. Um, and, and I'll add that the, that the low coverage rates for infants and toddlers, uh, and as well as adolescents, young adults, and, and even older young adults, uh, is, that, that is very, very concerning. And it's clear that we should not continue the, the path that we've, uh, we've taken thus far. So if, if clinicians and pharmacists have to use flow diagrams and other, other helpful items and uh, like posters and such to understand which vaccines they should give for whom and when, uh, the public's response really shouldn't be a surprise. Um, so I enthusiastically uh, support this recommendation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I th Dr. Cohen, I think, did I cut you off? Did, did... Great, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to, uh, I am totally in agreement, but I did just wanna make the comment that I don't wanna forget that we also saw data that the monovalent primary series was working quite well uh, against uh, infection or symptomatic infection in uh, younger children. And so there will be a period of time where there won't be bivalent primary series available. That will take some time, I assume. And I, I just think that we need to be clear that people should still continue to get vaccinated and not wait for, um, for these uh, bivalent primary series products. Okay, thank you. Dr. Offit. I agree with everything that my committee members just said. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Pergam. It gets hard to add to comments that people have made, but I will just reiterate that clarifying, making the process simpler 
for the community is going to be critical. And I think there's real value in that. It also feels um, and, and indicates better from the data that, you know, we're choosing strains that are a little more relevant to what we're seeing in the community. And I think there's real value in that. So I'll be really curious about the next stage in discussion about choosing the, the specific strains. So I'm really looking forward to that component of it because I think that is actually where the rubber meets the road in this discussion. Okay, thank you. And I'm next, and I don't have anything to add to the discussion. So, uh, Dr. Rubin. Sorry, nothing to add. Okay. So now we're going to go, Dr. Gellin. Yeah, thanks. Um, on top of the few comments I had before, I, you know, I think that this is, we're at a pivot point, and I think this is an opportunity as we make this move to really evaluate every part of this and make sure that all the assumptions that went into this are the right ones. Uh, and while I have the microphone, my vaccine card, I'm out of lines. And so maybe the other, uh, the other pivot point is to try to figure out how we get into the information age rather than carrying around these little pieces of paper that we hope we don't lose. Amen. Uh, Dr. Hawkins. Uh, yes, thanks for the opportunity. And I have nothing else to add to my original comments. Dr. Hildreth. Thank you, Dr. Perlman. Um, I agree with the approach that's being taken here. There's a lot of disharmony in the public about these vaccines. They're very confused about all the formulations and different manufacturers. So hopefully this will solve some of that. I hope we can get a better job of vaccinating children. I think that's a big concern. Uh, and I also want to point out that the impression one gets from listening to these meetings that we're focusing on mRNA vaccines when the Novavax uh, recombinant protein vaccine is an excellent one as well and should be part of our conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Lee? Uh, I don't have anything to add to what's been said. Thank you. Dr. Levy? As we've turned the corner from a pandemic phase to an endemic phase, Today's uh, vote marks a big practical win for the American people. Uh, this is going to really simplify things, benefit public health. There's more work ahead as we discussed today, but this will be a big win, thanks. Thank you. Dr. McGinnis. Um, here we go. Um, I had four points. I addressed the first, which was to the FDA, was that COVID is not flu. I addressed the third and the fourth, which is you have a bivalent. Are there any data to suggest it's better than a monovalent as a booster? Um, and secondly, you know, we, we, we really don't have, a, what's the public messaging around this? I took all these vaccines, I still got sick. But I have a second point that I want to just bring up is that this whole conversation is very much mRNA focused. Um, and I think Dr. Hildreth brought this up just uh, like 30 seconds ago. I'm concerned about that because, you know, I've been in that area for a very long time. And it's like first to market gets the place. And I get it. I understand how that works. But it may not be the best for what we're thinking about either as priming or as boosting. So I want to urge making place for other um, platforms. Um, mRNA has been fantastic. They can produce it really, really quickly. Um, but it may not give us the breadth of, of coverage, which is really what I think our problem is right now. We know we She's induce correct. um really good neutralizing antibody with mRNA vaccines, but it seems to be pretty short-lived. We can boost it again, and then again it seems to be pretty short-lived. So or lived or lived, however you want to pronounce it. Um and so I want to be sure we don't shut down other platforms in trying to achieve what is the best approach on either an individual or a population basis. Thank you. So did, did you have a comment on the vote? <laughs> I voted yes, because I, I, well, I thought that was my comment. Oh, okay. It was, it was just why you voted the way you did. Okay. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Dr. Meisner. Thank you, Dr. Perlman. 
Um, and I voted yes, uh, because I think it's it's very hard to predict the evolution of this virus. I think that it, we can say that new sequences will appear on uh, a regular basis. And uh, any assessment of vaccine efficacy is really a snapshot in time based on the circulating variants and background immunity that comes from vaccines or infection or both. Uh, so I think having a bivalent vaccine is 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 uh, reasonable, and I think it should be standardized. And I also agree with Dr. Hildreth and Dr. McGinnis. I I think. Uh, it's important for the pro, for the protein platform uh, to continue to be uh, available because we don't fully understand yet uh, all the advantages and disadvantages of different vaccines. But I, it's it's important to have um, more than one platform. Over. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Thank you. Fully supportive. Certainly voted yes. Simpler is better. And uh, frankly, I think we saw great evidence today that closer is better, even when the strain that's actually in the vaccine has long disappeared or on its way out. Uh, it had relieved my fears that we would be in this game of trying to chase the latest and greatest. And we saw reassuring data today that says just getting closer gives us some additional benefit. I'm hoping that the momentum of this simplification and this additional ben uh, efficacy and safety data will spur additional vaccination acceptance uh, at all age groups. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Reingold? Uh, I agree with Dr. Offit. Okay, thank you. Dr. Sawyer? Our rationale is the same as Dr. Nelson. Bivalent is better, simple is better. Thank you. And Dr. Wharton? Thank you. Uh, no additional comments. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So now we're going to move on to the two discussion topics. How to, should we put there is more. <laughs> What happened? Did I jinx them? Okay, so the two top of these two discussion topics are the first one, which we'll discuss first, uh, is uh, simplification of COVID-19 vaccine use, immunization schedule. Please discuss and provide input on simplifying the immunization schedule to authorize or approve a two-dose series in certain young children and in older adults and uh, people with compromised immunity and one dose in all other individuals. So we're going to discuss that first, and then we'll I'll read the second one uh, in a bit of time, and we'll discuss that one. So do I have comments on this one? Dr. Rubin? You th thank you. Um, a, a question and a comment. The first the question is for the those who have never been uh, infected or vaccinated, we would not give a priming dose. That's the idea here, that we'd give a single dose. And uh, that that does seem, we do have data for that. And it does suggest that a two-dose series is better. Um, I'm not sure if that's what that means here. Um, and it seems like everyone who has not been vaccinated and doesn't have a good record of, of infection should require two doses. Uh, otherwise, I think it's okay. But um, after we... I just want to point out how little we know. We know nothing really about dosing intervals and how that affects uh, the immunity that we get and or protection, more important pr protection that we get. And, and I would think that we really want to be doing those studies. Um, it's very important to collect those data. It can be collected as part, of, of course, we have to make decisions. Uh, the FDA has to decide what the dosing interval is going to be. But I think it's very important to in advance decide what kind of data should be collected so that we could understand if we're doing the right thing. Thank you. I think Dr. Marks, did you want to respond to that? I, I, no, I didn't want to respond. 
Let's respond. I just wanted to make a correction here. We we meant to we we don't mean to limit you to thinking about a two dose series. We wanted to to, to just note that a multiple dose series with an example. It could be two doses, but uh, the the you know, some might have questions about whether it would be more than that in uh, uh, in those with uh, uh, compromised immunity. I think the main major issue is. The concept was if you've had documented COVID-19 or if you've been vaccinated previously, you would just need one dose versus others who might have multiple doses. Thank you. That's that that Thanks. Clears it up. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Gantz. Thank you. Yeah, I was looking at this because of the way that it was phrased to us is this is in previously immune individuals. And so this I think is getting at do we need to continue to need quote boosters? Um, and what would Should be the timing of that? Stop watching um, further. And, it is um, quite I think a, that we have raised over this meeting time, but I think since we're discussing it, it's important to bring it right strokes. here. This that is going to be, be um, a probably different discussion for different groups as is outlined there. So I think we need age think? specific information and underlying condition specific information. And this leads into persistence. We're in a completely different place than we were originally when we kind of needed to get our population community boosting and immune. I'm sorry, immune and that related to how many doses that we need. I also think those people who continue to be naive year to year will obviously need a different um, a, a different schedule. And I'm not sure that two doses, that's the way it was studied. That's the way we accepted it. But we saw that we did need a boost. And I'm not sure that isn't the right way to do prime, prime boosts like many naive people need coming into a new season. So I think we're in a very different place. We have a lot of population immunity. And I think we need persistent studies to answer this question. And I think those need to include broad immunogenicity studies that's been outlined, T cell, B cell, mucosal. Combined with efficacy data. I will discuss these uh, findings about the stroke separately, and I will discuss the UK's decision separately. This uh, meeting is wearing me out. It is long, and they want to just discuss. So I hope it is okay that we break for now. My request again is that over here, I do not uh, ask you to go get vaccinated or I do not ask you to not get vaccinated. I present this data as well. I explain the mechanisms as well. I presented the trials as well. So I would like us with each other to be decent. I see some comments where people just kept attacking each other. It's not useful. This is being used incorrectly by others. So. Stay safe, healthy, happy, whatever way you think you can protect yourself. That is your call and your doctor, your community, your family, your decision. So with this, stay safe, happy, healthy, uh, like, subscribe, and share. And um, I would see you maybe not this evening. I have to do one more lecture. But by tomorrow or Monday, I would discuss these two things, the strokes here and the UK decision. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.